I believe that institutions, because they are so powerful, um, can become infected with assumptions and goals that, however unintentionally, be, can become very damaging. And I saw that in the story I told about the pharmaceutical companies who lost track of who they were really serving. And therefore, I believe that having a formal mechanism to pause and to say, no matter how good this might look, what are we really thinking about? What are we really saying? What are we really asking? What would be the real outcomes? What evidence can we marshal from before? What risk could we anticipate that maybe weren't thought about a, in a first pass? That is a societal innovation from my perspective. I gather that this, I mean, it certainly wasn't around in the 1970s. I think it was just getting started then. So the idea that now not only there are these institutions, but that people are sharing knowledge and best practice in order to deepen their practice and strengthen their knowledge, this is a sign of the maturing of a society. Because our society is dangerously close to adopting technologies without any serious awareness of what the moral or political implications of those technologies might be. Let me tell you a brief story about that. When I was at Harvard Business School in the late 1980s, uh, I was asked to, I was writing business school cases. And I went to write a case about a company uh, that was examining a technique now well known called the restricted length fragment polymorphism. It was about how you break up and cut and splice different gene sequences. And um, they were working on topics, and I went to talk to the boss, the CEO, and I, who's a doctor, and I asked him what kinds of things would they work on. And he said, well, we work on this, we work on that. And then I went and talked to the scientists who were actually splicing things. And, and I said, well, what would you be willing to work on? Would you be willing to like, redo the gene of a human being or you know, cut and splice? Or, um, and I'm like, well, you know, that might be really interesting. And then I said, what about tobacco? Would you ever like, work on tobacco to improve tobacco you know, so it was more potent or something like that? And they said, oh, no, 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 we hate smoking. Joe and I, neither of us smokes. We would never do that. And I was really struck by the anomaly that these guys, who are perfectly good guys, were willing to work on whatever the boss said. But when they found one little zone for which they had a moral objection, it's like, oh, forget that. We'd never do tobacco. That would be bad. And my concern at the time was that meant that whatever there wasn't a red flag raised about, they would just do. You know, let's see how many. How many ways we can split this uh, fertilized egg into, I mean, who knows what thing they were thinking of. So, so the, the, the idea that a systematic arrangement has come into being where these questions, however messily, are addressed is exactly what we need to be doing. I mean, I wish there were uh, institutional review boards for um, internet technology or many or how about drone technology or how about uh, I don't know if you've seen on the internet the extraordinary number of machines that are being invented that uh, are essentially um, robot warriors they can run upstairs now they can you know they're eight feet high they're 300 feet to I mean you know we have plenty of movies that talk about where that goes they have a mechanical dog who can run 40 miles an hour and not be tipped over. I'd like an institutional review board for how far, how dangerous we want to make that dog. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that I'm very encouraged that we now have an analogy for what the implications of technology are, even at the early stage, for their impact on human beings. And I hope it can spread to other, other fields. I think. Uh, I think that should be an area of study for this conference. What, what other fields need?
uh, irbs.